All right, good morning again. As I mentioned, we have been going through the book of Daniel, and we are now at the end, Daniel chapter 12. I don't know from your perspective, church, if you think this has been a long series, but it has flown by for me. And I don't know if you feel that it has been a helpful series, but it has been helpful to me. I've learned that I still have a lot to learn. In the book of Daniel, we see a constant drumbeat, a steady drumbeat. And this morning's text is going to continue that drumbeat, but it's going to intensify. And in chapter 12, we're going to read some of the most realistic, sobering, and honor and honest words that you will ever read in the Bible. But you're also going to see some of the sweetest, most encouraging, faith-building words in the Bible as well. I feel like I owe you an apology. If you were taught that becoming a Christian meant that you were going to have an easy life, then no wonder you've been confused. Nowhere is that promise given in the Scriptures. In fact, we are promised that when we face the Lord and begin going against the grain of this world, we will be hated. We will endure much suffering and persecution, but we will never be abandoned. We have a Lord, Jesus Christ, who was hated, who was persecuted, who was murdered. And he said, if they hate me, they're going to hate you, but I will be with you and I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Daniel didn't understand the vision he was given in chapter 10, 11, and 12. He didn't understand all of it. And for that, I just want to find him, hug his neck, and say, I don't either. Verse 8 tells us that he didn't understand it all. Um, Daniel did not get all of the precise answers that he was looking for. In fact, if you'll look at verses 8 and 9, and we're going to read the entire chapter in a moment, but he says, As for me, I heard but could not understand, so I said, My Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? And he said, Go your way. <laughs> How do you like that? I don't understand. I need some help. Go your way. So Daniel didn't get the precise answers that he was looking for. Maybe this morning you will leave and say, I didn't get all the answers out of Daniel that I was looking for. May I humbly say, join the club. But what Daniel did get, and what you're going to get today, is a glimpse into the future where we see God reigning and ruling from his throne with wisdom, power, and might. We see God protecting his people, not always protecting their physical lives, but certainly protecting their faith and their faithfulness. And we see God's promises and presence in living color. Church, I don't know what you and I will be called to endure. You will probably, I will probably be tempted to doubt God at times, to question God, to say, how long? Or why this? But let's let the book of Daniel in chapter 12 concluding, let's let it encourage us. God wins. Evil and all of God's enemies will be eliminated will come to an end. There will be a day when there will be no sin, no suffering, no death, no disobedience. Christ won the victory. Christ wins the victory. All who are with Christ win the victory. And everyone not with Christ loses big time. So with that as our introduction, let's stand, please. And together, you read in your heart. I'll read out loud, but you read prayerfully, I'll read prayerfully. Let's hit these last 13 verses. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise 
And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of the heavens, and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words, seal them up, seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth, and knowledge will increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others were standing, one on this bank of the river and the other on that bank of the river. And one said to the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river, How long will it be until the end of these wonders? I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river as he raised his right hand and his left toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times and a half a time. And as soon as they finished shattering the hands or the power of the holy people, all these events will be complete. As for me, I heard, but I could not understand. So I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? He said, go your way. Go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end of time. Many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. From the time that, regular, that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation set up, there will be 1,290 days. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days. But as for you, go your way to the end, and you will enter into rest and rise again, and your allotted portion at the end of the age. You may be seated. May God help us, guide us, and empower us to not only be hearers of his word, but doers. In Jesus' name, amen. De Guid says, The apocalyptic parts of the Bible, like the book of Daniel, remind us that we live in a world that cannot simply be fixed. It needs to be recreated. To be sure, God will eliminate all evil in the world, but sin and sickness will be defeated according to His timetable, not ours. In the end, the broken shall be made whole and all tears wiped away. But until the coming and consummation of God's kingdom, brokenness and suffering, pain and persecution will continue to be the normal state for believers. We live in a world that is profoundly broken. He goes on to say, this has been the message of the book of Daniel from the beginning. And it is still the focus as the book draws to a close. Remember, chapter 12 is part of the chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12 vision. And this is an answer to Daniel's concerns in the third year of Cyrus. At that time, God's people had returned to Jerusalem, yet they found progress frustratingly slow and difficult in the face of powerful opposition. And as a result, the people started to despair. And so this is part of the answer to that. That prayer, God, what, what's going on? I thought, I thought when the 70 years were over and we were able to go back to our land and start building the temple, I thought our problems were going to go away. And God's saying, no, that's, you misunderstood. The book of Daniel never assumes that we would find living in a world that has fallen easy. On the contrary, it anticipates the fact that we will frequently find ourselves crying out, see if you've asked these questions. How long, O oh Lord? Where are you, God? What are you doing? What are you up to? Why are your people dying and despairing? Why are they not prospering and victorious? How long do you think your people can hold on, God? These are questions that Daniel 12 is designed to address. One more small quote. 
How do we live as broken people in a broken world? Should we give in to despair and assume that this is the way things will always be? Should we simply seek to cope with our problems, to numb the pain? The book of Daniel is very far from being a sedative given to suffering people in order to dull their pain. On the contrary, the book of Daniel is a wake-up call. A wake-up call to all of us to live with wisdom in this world, this broken world. And by all means, we should pursue obedience to God with heartfelt passion, using whatever resources are available to us. Yet at the same time, we should recognize that even as we grow in grace, we will continue to be profoundly broken, living in a broken world. That's what I meant a moment ago when I said in this chapter you're not going to get a quick fix. You're not going to get a slap on the back and everything's going to be okay. You're going to hear the most realistic, sobering, honest words found in Scripture. But alongside those words, you're going to find some of the sweetest, most encouraging, faith-building, endurance-enabling words as well. So those verses, those 13 verses we just read, they can be divided easily into two parts. You'll look at verses 1 through 4. This is a continuation and a conclusion of the vision and the prophecy that began in chapter, the end of chapter 10 and all the way through 11. If you didn't listen to Hunter's message last week, please do so. But then in verses 5 through 13, that's the second part, Daniel hears two angels talking to the one who revealed this vision to him, and they're asking questions. And then Daniel asks a question of his own. And even in that section, the second part of this chapter, there, there's two subgroups. First, verses 5 through 7, we have the angel's question. And then verses 8 through 13, we have Daniel's question. So let's go back to our text, verse 1. Now, at that time, Michael, we've already been introduced to Michael. In chapter 10, we see, we saw that there is a heavenly reality going on right now that's as real as the chair you're sitting in. Spiritual warfare, Ephesians 6. I don't know about you. I was talking to Ariana a minute ago at the coffee pot, and Sunday mornings are difficult mornings for, for me, for the Wells family. Uh, maybe not for you. Uh, that Lionel Richie fellow, he's not a good theologian, right? Easy like Sunday morning. <laughs> I don't think he went to church. <laughs> but I have thought about that before and how, <clears throat> yes, I'm a sinner, saved by grace, but a sinner, absolutely. So are my kids, so is my wife. So are the dogs, right? Not saved by grace. Um, so I'm not trying to blame everything on the, the spiritual forces of, of evil, but there's just an intense spiritual battle, more so than Monday through Saturday at the Wells house on Sunday morning. And I'm convinced that it's part of this Ephesians 6 warfare. We've already been introduced to Michael. Uh, Gabriel was bringing the answer to Daniel. He's delayed three weeks because of the prince of Persia. Uh, but then Michael steps in. And, and settles the issue, and Gabriel is able to come and give the answer. But here we see again, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, we see at this apparent culmination of human history, the end of time, we might say, yes, all along God's people had faced opposition. Nothing new there. But here there seems to be an intensification of the drumbeat. It even says it in verse 1. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. You know, over the book of Daniel, I, I think a good verse for us to interpret help interpret would be John 16, 33. You know this verse. Jesus, our Lord, said these words. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. 
In the world, you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. And so here, at, when the battle seems to be raging the hottest, God is present with four precious promises and realities that I want to show you. But before I show you these four precious promises and reality, I want to tell you why I think God gave these to Daniel. Because, you know, Daniel didn't see this fulfilled in his lifetime. I believe it's to help you and me and, for, and to help his contemporaries that would have come along in the time of Antiochus Epiphanes and in A.D. 70 and subsequently you and me today. And our, hey, our children and grandchildren if the Lord tarries. And it's to give them and to give us what theologians call an eschatological ethic. That's the word for the day. You'll be quizzed next week. An eschatological ethic. Listen to what Legan Duncan says about this word, an eschatological ethic. He says, this is a practical instruction for daily living in light of our future hope. In other words, our ethic is impacted. It's informed by the promises that God has made to us about the future. It's not that we're just supposed to know certain cool events that might unfold in the future. It's that our lives are meant to be transformed and changed and helped and encouraged and strengthened now because of what God is going to do in the future. These directives, these commandments for our daily Christian living are based on our understanding of God's promises and God's presence in the future and support our Christian hope in these realities. I love that. An eschatological ethic. So as you're reading through this, as I'm reading through this, I want you to have that in mind, that God, He intends to build you up today, to build me up. He knows what you're going to face. He knows what I'm going to face. We don't. But when we face it, brothers and sisters, let's have an eschatological hope that is rooted and grounded in God's promises and presence that changes the way we look at the internet when we're reading today's news. Uh, or if you're old school, as you're flipping through a newspaper and you're reading today's news, as you're listening to a podcast or the radio and you're thinking, oh, Lord, how long? What's going on? Let this infuse hope and obedience into your life. So I told you there's four precious promises and realities that he gives us in this chapter. Let's look at the first one. The first one is this. God protects and rescues his people in the fire, parentheses, not from the fire. We've already seen that in Daniel chapter 3 that God could have this same sovereign God that protected Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from even coming out smelling like smoke. They didn't even smell like smoke. Not a, not a uh, stitch of clothing was singed. He could have prevented them from going into the fire to begin with. But he didn't. And he came alongside them in the fire. And this is a pattern of how God rescues his people. He rescues us in the fire, not from it. Right off the bat, we're reminded this archangel Michael, this great prince standing over God's people. The Puritans and the Reformers used to interpret Michael as Jesus Christ himself. Now, I can't quite go that far, but I see their point. The, word, the name Michael does mean one who is like God. Jesus Christ in the book of John is the one who is told to be the keeper and protector of God's people. John 10, 27 through 30, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. No one. 
So it's not a terrible idea to see this as a picture of Christ, but I just can't quite go there. But it does remind us, does it not, that God, through His appointed servant, Michael, is with His people to protect them powerfully. We, we go back to chapter 10 and we see this warfare where Gabriel and the prince of Persia are fighting and then Michael comes in and step, says, step aside. And it happens. It reminds us that we do not live in an impersonal universe, that God is not distant, standing back unconcerned. The forces of history, our very lives are not controlled by happenstance. God is personally involved and through the instruments of angels, in this case, he is protecting his people. So point number one, God protects and rescues his people from the fire and not always, or in the fire rather, but not always from it. Hold your place there and let's look to the book of Matthew for a moment. Some New Testament commentary probably on this very passage. Matthew 24, 17 through 22, during this time of intense persecution. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in these days. But pray that your flight will not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. And unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Speaking of this rescue, we see also a resurrection. Look at verse 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. And for commentary on that, I'd like to read 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you do not grieve as those who have no hope. But if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this way we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. So the first encouraging promise that we have is that God is with us. He's with us in the toughest of times. You may look back, I'm sure you can, mathematically speaking, and say this was the darkest period of time in my life. This was the di most difficult trial that I've endured so far. Can you think of that time? It's not easy to go back there, is it? Do you know with certainty that you will not face a darker time in this life? You don't, do you? I don't know if we're going to be alive when Daniel 12 uh, occurs, when the Lord Jesus descends and, and gathers up his elect who are in the ground first and then catches us up in the air with him. I don't know if we're going to be here when that happens. But it seems to indicate that when that is going to happen, it's going to be the darkest time, not just in your life, but ever. And I don't know if we'll be here when that happens or not. But again, I can look back and, and tell you if we had time to grab a pot of coffee what the darkest time thus far in my life has been. And you could too. And we're reminded that even in that very moment, the Lord God was with us to protect us and to provide for us. But here we have a second precious promise. The bodies of all of God's elect, and the elect 
the book of Revelation says, are those who are written in the book of life from before the foundation of the world. The bodies of all of God's elect who have died, especially those who lost their lives through persecution and martyrdom, will be resurrected to join their soul unto everlasting life and reward. Those who say the Old Testament saints didn't have an idea of life after death or resurrection, here is a crystal clear picture of that. But conversely, all of the bodies of the enemies of God, uh, the enemies of God's people, they too will be resurrected to join their soul unto everlasting shame. Literally, the word is abhorrence to everlasting condemnation and eternal death. In other words, Jesus Christ is the judge. He's coming back for his people if they have died in the fray of battle, they're not a second-class Christian. He will raise them up first, body to be united with soul, and then the rest of his people. But he also is the judge of those who do not love him and follow him. And he will raise their bodies to unite with their souls as well for an everlasting death. Here's how that would have encouraged Daniel. Here the, here's how that should encourage you. No act of faithfulness, no act of faithfulness will go unnoticed and not rewarded. And no act of defiance, no act of God's enemies harming God's people will go unchecked and unpunished. You and I don't have to take vengeance. We rest in the sovereignty of God. And as Romans 12 remind us, reminds us, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. And I don't know about you, but that gives me great hope as I have contemplated the, the fate of our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan this past week. And as... Hunter reminded us last week how at that point the Taliban were going door to door, confiscating phones, and if they found a Bible app, killed the men on the spot, took the women and the daughters to be sex slaves. And as I think about that, my blood begins to boil, and I begin to get in the flesh a little bit. I begin to think, what if I was over there with my wife and sons and daughters? But this passage brings me peace. This passage gives me hope. This passage gives me an eschatological ethic. Now, brief parentheses, how do we know who God's people are and who God's enemies are? Well, vertically, we could say those who are in the book of life written before the foundation of the world, those are God's people. And those who are not in the book of life written before the foundation of the world are not God's people. And you would be correct in one sense. But Daniel fleshes this out a little bit of how to know if you're in the book of life saved or not in the book of life lost. He says, as we study this, if we had more time to dig, the truly saved have an insight about them. They have a wisdom about them. They're not like a leaf in a hurricane just tossed and turned every which way. They are grounded in truth. And they are leading many to righteousness. Do you see that in verse Three, those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead the many to righteousness, they will shine like the stars forever and ever. So this is one way to know if you are the real deal. This is one way to know, to sort of check, to see and make sure my name's in that book of life. Well, here, here are some practical ways. God gives his children insight and wisdom. You could even push that a little deeper. Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So you want to know if you're the real deal? Do you fear the Lord? 
Do you fear trusting in your own wisdom and intellect so much so that it makes you wise because you're leaning on the Lord's revealed word and will? Are you, even when it's the toughest, are you seeking to lead others to righteousness? You know, when the going gets tough, the true Christian, listen, by the grace of God, please hear that. The true Christian is not going to have this self-preservation mindset completely. I'm not saying you never will. But you're going to press through that and you're going to say, you know what, I can't just hole up and bunker down. I, I got to get out and lead many to righteousness. But the opposite would be true for the people whose names are not written in the book of life. And maybe the clearest way to see that is look at verse 4 and verse 10. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. We'll talk about that in a minute. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. That's a difficult passage to translate, but I believe in the flow of the context, what he's saying is during this time of intense persecution, there's going to be a thinning of the crowd, if you will. And those who are the real deal are going to stay anchored to thus saith the Lord. But those who are phony baloney, they will run around looking for quote unquote wisdom in every area but the Bible. 2 Timothy 4, 3 tells us that in the last days there will be those who do not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. You know, they look around and say, what, what do you think about what's going on in the world right now? And if someone goes, well, let's open the word of God. And, ah, nah, I don't want to hear your perspective. So they don't fear the Lord. They don't tremble at God's word. They're looking for answers in every place but the place that is our final authority. And then verse 10 spells it out even more clearly. Many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand. But those who have insight will understand. Drop a little grudem on you for a minute. I, I love his definition of the clarity of Scripture. Because you might be sitting here today going, well, man, I want to know if I'm truly saved or not. I mean, that would be a good question, right? A good, good thought. Man, there's some parts of the Bible I don't understand, and there's some difficult teachings. I mean, Daniel didn't understand it all, and Pastor Brent said he doesn't understand it all. So how do I know? Because he said that the, the truly saved have insight and and wisdom, but those who are not saved, they, they don't get it. And I'm not saying we're going to get every jot and tittle of the scriptures, but there is an ability, a spirit-given ability for the true Christian to understand God's word and apply it to their lives. Listen to how he says this, uh, Wayne Grudem. He says, clarity of scripture, the idea that the Bible is written in such a way that its teachings are able to be understood by all who will read it, seeking God's help and being willing to follow it. We're in a difficult section of the Bible, right? I'm, in some ways, I'm going to be sad to see Daniel go. In some ways, I'm not. Can I be real with you for a moment? But God's word as a whole can be understood, listen, by all who read it, seeking God's help. I've told you before, pray before you read the Bible, pray as you read the Bible, pray after you read the Bible, and who are willing to follow it. Sometimes, if we're honest, we don't understand something because we don't want to follow it. And we just sort of put our fingers in our ears and our hands over our eyes and go, yeah, let's move on to the next devotional reading for the day. This is the difference between those who are saved and those who are not. 
in verse 10, we saw this idea of a purifying, you know, this, this is martyrdom. This is God's people being cut down. So if you have a, an eschatology that says, no, 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 God's people, they're, they're always taken from the fire. They, they never go in it. They're, they're, God kind of whisks them around it. I don't know how you make heads or tails of not just Daniel, but many portions of Scripture There is this idea that God is not taking his people out of the fire as quickly as they would want, but it's so that they will be purged, purified, refined. And you might think this morning, how could I stand? I don't know, Pastor. I don't know if the, if the Taliban knocked on my door and said, give me your phone. I don't know if I wouldn't give them a knuckle sandwich instead, you know. And I know you and I think like that. But let me remind you of a precious, precious promise out of First Peter. Uh, it's in uh, First Peter chapter 4, verse 12 through 14. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though something strange were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice, rejoice with exultation. And look at verse 14. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. If you've ever read John Piper's book, Future Grace, he, he pulls some nuggets out of this passage. He, he, in essence, says, we may look at some history book and, and see a martyr like, I believe it was John Huss, who was lit on fire and sang praises to his Lord until his face caught on fire. And we may look at that and say, how in the world? But John Piper reminds us, you don't have that kind of grace upon your life right now because you're not going through that kind of trial right now. But if it's God's providence that you go through that kind of trial right now, then the same spirit of glory and of God will rest upon you at that moment. So again, you, you could do it. I could do it by the grace of God and for the glory of God. So these are these four precious promises. Number one, God protects his people. He rescues his people. Number two, uh, he will resurrect his people. Uh, he will resurrect the body to the soul. This is a promise that God gives us. Number three, if you'll look at verse three, we've touched on it. But this is still a further description of the glory that awaits the faithful. Notice again, remind you, verse 1, God will protect the faithful. Verse 2, he is told, we are told that if, if they are faithful unto death, then the Lord will resurrect the faithful. And now, verse 3, we're told that the Lord is going to bless the faithful and those who have insight with a future of glory that shines like the heavens and shines like the stars. This is speaking of us in our glorified state with the Lord Jesus Christ. What a day that will be. So our goal is not death. No one should run around going, bring it. Bring death. Okay, I see Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Bring it. No, no, no. Our goal is not death. Our goal is the resurrection. Our goal is a glorified, transformed body united with our soul where we will be with our Lord, shining as the heavens, shining as the stars forever and ever and ever. And even in the Old Testament, this was the goal for the believer. Legan Duncan says, notice this encouragement that God has heaped up for Daniel. He has given him a grim picture in chapter 10 and chapter 11. He's given him a grim picture in chapter 12, but he mingles these precious promises within it. 
I love this. So that even in the midst of all of the turmoil, God's people must live not as victims. We are never victims. And especially those who feel oppression as a real part of their experience, there is nothing more blessed to know than this truth of God's providence. Though we may feel like our fate is out of our control and in the hands of our enemies, God is saying, don't think that you are ever truly a victim, for no child of mine can be victimized while I am on my throne. And therefore, every trial is purposed for your good and for my glory. And that's found in verse 3. And then the fourth precious promise and reality that we need to linger over for a moment is simply a restatement of what we've seen in Daniel chapters 1 through 12 to this point. And that is this. God's people must be prepared to endure suffering and persecution for the long haul. This is why I said at the beginning, I almost want to apologize to you. If someone slapped you on the back, led you through a prayer, and said, now your life is going to be a bowl of cherries. And again, if someone told you that, they didn't tell you the truth. And no wonder you've been confused. But again, I'm not painting a pessimistic, doomsday picture of the Christian life. There is joy in the journey. Amen. We have the very promises of God, the very presence of God. Uh, you might picture, if you're in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that fourth, like a son of God who's in there with you. And the body language seemed like they were kind of dancing around. So this is not a, a doomsday picture. God is wise. God is good. God is sovereign. How should it encourage you for me to tell you this morning? Buckle your seatbelt. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And it might get worse before it gets better. How could that encourage you? Well, this is how the book of Acts encouraged the, the new converts. For example, uh, in Acts 14, 22, Luke said, We strengthen the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying, Through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Is, is that how you encourage a new Christian? Is that how you encourage yourself? Well, this is how the early church encouraged the new converts. They said, hey, this is, you got to go through tribulations before you enter the kingdom. I heard an illustration once that sort of makes sense here. Um, if, you know, if you're walking down a dark hallway and someone jumps out and yells, boo, that's going to scare you, right? If you're holding a cup of coffee, you're probably going to wear that cup of coffee, or they might wear that cup of coffee. But what if 30 seconds before you entered that hallway, you, you peeked down the hallway and you saw them sneak into the side bedroom, tiptoeing, and pull the door to behind them? That would make all the difference in the world, wouldn't it? Yeah, they still might frighten you a little bit because even though you know that they're there, they might jump out with such fierceness and volume that it jolts you. But you would not be caught off guard completely. And Daniel is saying, God is saying through Daniel, don't be caught off guard. Don't be caught off guard. It's, it's coming. But it's not catching God off guard it's part of this wise and good and sovereign God's plan. We've already seen in verse 10. It's part of his refining fire for your life. It is for your good ultimately. It is for his glory ultimately. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7 says, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you may be distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Daniel has these four precious truths that God gives him. 
these four precious realities and promises. Number one, God is there to protect his people. He doesn't always protect us from dying, but he protects our faith, which is more precious than pure gold. Number two, those who die will be resurrected, especially those who have died a martyr's death. Their bodies will be resurrected to join their soul for everlasting life. This will not be some boring existence where we're in heaven, sitting on a cloud, plucking a harp with a child with a diaper. This is reigning and ruling with Christ. This is shining like the heavens. This is shining like the stars. And number four, we must arm ourselves, prepare ourselves to endure suffering for the long haul. And this is for our good and God's glory. I love it how the angel asks another angel, how long? You see that in verse, verse 5, verse 6. I mean, that, that kind of blows me away. You got these two angels and one says to another as they're looking over the, the vision, how, how long? How long are these, you know, this, this suffering, how long is it going to go on until the end of these wonders? And he gives, the other one gives him an answer. I don't fully understand that answer. Daniel didn't fully understand that answer, but he does give him an answer. He says in verse 7, he raised his hands, he cried out to the one who lives forever, and he said, for a time, times and half a time, and as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people. This at least means, I think we all would agree here, that God is in charge of when the suffering and persecution begins and when it ends. It's not just some random, indefinite, well, just whenever it's done, it's done. The number three and a half is half of seven. The number seven means completeness. So this is at least Daniel's way of understanding. It's not going to be a complete wipeout for God's people. Oh, it's going to look like the enemies of God and the enemies of God's people are having their way, but no it is not complete. It is incomplete. It is according to God's timetable, not their timetable. And at the end of verse 7, we see a, a perplexing phrase. It says, until they finish shattering the hands or the power of the holy people. I'll be honest with you. As I'm reading through that, I think you do this too. I think we all do. You kind of, you have a theological grid and you start to think of what the next verse is going to say. You know, you're flowing, your head's kind of nodding along with the text. And every now and then we'll get to a part where we have to go, pump the brakes, put it in reverse, back up and go, whoa, I don't, I don't know if I got that. Because I thought it would say until all of God's enemies are crushed. And then the end will be. But it says until the power of God's people are crushed. If we look at church history, if we look at history in the Bible, we see that this is indeed the pattern of God. To not take his people out of the fire, but to refine his people through the fire. For us to come to the end of our strength, for us to come to rock bottom, it would seem, and to say, God, I have no one but you. To be purged, as verse 10 says, to be uh, purified and refined through that First Peter 1, 6 through 7 refiner's fire. God, for his own sovereign and good purposes, allows his people to suffer greatly. But I promise you what you and I have suffered, are suffering or will suffer, pales in comparison to God allowing his son, Jesus Christ, to suffer on the cross. And really, that might be a better question. There is a theological answer for that, but we might say, God, 
Why the sinless Son of God? Why did He suffer so greatly for my sins? He didn't deserve any of that. And God would say, no, He didn't. You did. But to satisfy my justice and my love, this is the only way that you could be right with me. Let's read a brief quote. We're almost done here. Hang in there. Back to this idea of the angels curious about the affairs of man. Again, you, you picking that up? These angels are, how, how much longer are they going to suffer down there? Listen to what DeGuid says. What can angels learn from beholding the likes of us? Surely they can learn the power of God's grace that takes flawed and broken people and sustains them through the overwhelming trials of life until we arrive safely in our heavenly home. If God were to heal all our brokenness this side of heaven, there would be no wondering in, in heaven over God's patience with us. No awe at his long suffering and the mercy that he shows his children. Who needs patience and long suffering to persist with perfect creatures? Yet if God in his mercy can take unmitigated dross like us, and transform us into gold, will not the heavens themselves shout out loud to the praise of the glory of His grace? If God can take weak, compromised human beings and bind them together into a people who will ultimately be spotlessly holy, will not all creation magnify His name? This age, then, is revealed as a constant period of refining and testing, a time of ongoing and great tribulation in which, God on, in which only God's grace sustains us all the way to the end. But it will be followed by another age, an age of glory, an age of rest, an age of reward for those who have been found faithful in Christ. In the age to come, the wise will shine like the brightness of heaven and like the stars forever and ever. Verse 11, just very, very briefly. Um, it seems to go back to what God already told Daniel in chapter 9 and in last week's message from Hunter chapter 11. This seems to go back to the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, where there would be this great abomination of desolation, sacrificing pigs on the altars, erecting a statue of Zeus, and prohibiting God's people from praying or making sacrifices. It's as if God is saying, Daniel, some of this chapter 12 and chapter 11, some of this applies to a context that you and your contemporaries will be more familiar with and will need to brace themselves for, but some of it does not. Some of it applies to the, the far and distant future. So he, his contemporaries would have been familiar with what happened out of chapter 11 Antiochus Epiphanes, we see A.D. 70, something similar, and yet we have this future end time persecution and suffering. The consistent thread is God is in control of when suffering begins and how long suffering will endure. God is mingling his tender mercies into the suffering that his people will encounter. And God's people must and will endure to the end by trusting God and leaning upon his precious promises and spirit. I end where I began. In the end, Daniel didn't get all of the precise answers he was looking for. Verse 8 I don't understand 
How will this unfold? Verse 9, go your way. This morning, you may not have all of the answers you were looking for, and I don't either. But let's focus on what God did make clear to Daniel. And if I'm sounding like a broken record, this theme just keeps coming up in the book of Daniel. God wants us to get it. We get a glimpse into the future, and we see God reigning and ruling from his throne with wisdom, power, and might. We see God protecting his people, not always their lives, but certainly their faith. We see God promising to use the trials in their lives for their good and his glory. We see God promising even to resurrect those who die in faithfulness to Christ. We see God promising to give them a glorious inheritance and a future reward. Look at verse 13. But as for you, go your way to the end. Then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. How are we to live right now? Remember that word eschatological ethic? We're to let these truths of who God is and his sovereignty and wisdom and mercy over the future, we're to let that so impact our lives that it affects the way we live Monday morning. I think that's what he's telling Daniel in verse 13. But as for you, go your way to the end. In other words, you got a calling. You got a job to do Monday morning, Daniel. You don't understand all of this, and what you do understand is heavy. Go to bed, get up, go to work. And let this eschatological ethic drive you, motivate you, uh, to let you do your job for the glory of God. Remember back in Byron's sermon, uh, chapter 8, verse 27, I love it. He, he says he got up, he was exhausted, he was sick, uh, but he carried on doing the king's business. I think verse 13 is very similar. Get up and do the king's business. So let's let these four truths motivate us to get up tomorrow morning and be the best employee that we, are, that we could be for the glory of Christ. To be the best dad and mom and husband and wife, to be the best son or daughter that we could be. To live with our head a little bit above the water when the world says, what on earth is going on? Our, our world is collapsing. We stand firm. We open our Bibles and we say, let's do a little study about the sovereignty of God and his purposes for his people. Is your name written in the book of life? How can you even know? Let's have that conversation. Let's have that gospel conversation. Let's be moved to wake up Monday morning to do our job for the glory of God. Let's be moved to love and good deeds. Let's be moved towards hope and not pessimism not doomsday. Let's be moved toward gospel conversation and proclamation. Let's be moved to be the kind of Christian who can say these words. You know these words, church, but do you mean these words? May the grace of God be so thick in our lives when we need it the most that we could be moved to be Christians who say and mean. What will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation Will distress, will persecution, will famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered, but in all these things we are overwhelmingly conquered through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ. Christ Jesus, our Lord. I don't know what you're going to be called to endure. You probably will be tempted to question God or doubt him. But let Daniel, all 12 chapters, 
let Daniel encourage you. God wins. Evil and all of yours and God's enemies will be limited and eliminated in the end. There will be a day when there is no sin, no suffering, no death, no disobedience. Jesus Christ won the victory on the cross. Jesus Christ wins in the end. And all who are with Christ win as well. And those who are not with Christ lose big time. They lose eternally. Let John 16, 33 echo in your heart and mind as we are dismissed. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you and ask that you would take these precious promises, these precious realities, and your tender presence, and you will so weave them into the fiber of our hearts that it produces a robust, gospel-centered, Christ-saturated, eschatological ethic that the world knows nothing of, that the world is either fleeing from truth or looking for quote-unquote truth in all the wrong places, but we can stand humbly and say, let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me make sure that your name is in that book of life. Let's, let's confirm your reservations. Thank you, Lord for these wonderful truths. There's so much of this book I still don't understand. And if I preach it again in five years, I may preach it differently than I did this time around. But I hope and pray that there's been enough breadcrumbs that have fallen off of this pulpit that we have all more than feasted. And we ask this in the merciful name of Jesus and God's people said, amen.